yourselves on on mute um, until the Q and A. Um, if you have any questions, you can pop them into the chat. We'll address them during the Q and A. And Carol and I will be adding links, and the speakers um, can add some links to to share. Um, any links that are put into the chat, we'll make sure are included um, in the follow up that we'll send in a couple of days with the notes from the lunch and learn today. Um, all right, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Carol, and we'll be we'll be recording as well, just as a reminder to folks. Yeah, great. Thanks, Megan. Um, so these lunch and learns, these were really an experiment during COVID. Pre-COVID, we hosted these in person where we bring a busload of funders and interested stakeholders to different communities um, to lift up and elevate different topics. We sort of paused them naturally during COVID and we heard a lot of folks were interested. Um, in the early days of COVID, my colleagues and I were having hundreds and hundreds of calls with Many of the folks on the on the call here and our, you know, our amazing nonprofit partners in the community and lifting up these really rich conversations. And we just heard a lot of people were interested in hearing these conversations. So we piloted uh, beginning last year monthly calls called Lunch and Learns, pivoting to this model where we invite by topic um, multiple different speakers from around the county or beyond to lift up given topics at hand. And it's provided an opportunity to sort of have a behind the scene view, but also hear about the impact of COVID and then opportunities moving forward. And we've really encouraged speakers to have an unvarnished view um, as if you're having a coffee with, with a peer or a stakeholder or a colleague so that they can authentically share what they're really hearing um, to empower you and really all of us with information to help us collectively move forward. All of the sessions have really rich data for us to all learn um, from our experts in the field. And then we have a dialogue <clears throat> for again, this unvarnished conversation. So these are casual, but really enriching. We, we record them so they can be a resource for the community. And then after the session, as Megan said, we're gonna share the variety of links and resources that so that we can all collectively continue our learning. Um, so we have an awesome lineup of speaker to, speakers today. We are really tickled that these folks who are all really busy and hold you know, national and regional leadership roles on this um, conversation of college readiness and higher education are, have joined us here today. Um, we're going to start the conversation from Rob, with Robert Days, who's the statewide director at Gear Up. Then we're going to move to Allison Caffrey, who's the national director of development and former New England executive director at Let's Get Ready. And we'll wrap things up with Lane Glenn, the president at Northern Essex Community Co um, College. Each of our speakers will just have a, you know, a 10, 15 minute opportunity to again share the background of their organizations the perspective of how things have pivoted during COVID and then where the opportunities and challenges lie ahead. Uh, and then we'll have a conversation for about 30 minutes of Q&A for you to ask questions and for us to all collectively learn together. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Robert. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am thrilled to be here and I was honored to, ask, uh, to be asked to present. Uh, along some of, of my colleagues here. So as they bring my slides up, I'll just give you a little background on, on myself. I've been an educator for about 14, going on 15 years in the Gear Up College and Career Readiness space. Um, prior to that, I was a, a, a principal and a middle school teacher in mathematics. So this has been my life's work. Uh, and I'm, I'm very proud to be, again, representing the Gear Up program and just to share some insights with you. start up one. Yeah, that's fine. So essentially, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of Gear Up. And on the left hand side, you can see that Gear Up stands for gaining early awareness and readiness for undergraduate programs. Uh, we are a federally funded program, and we're administered from the Depart the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education, and out of the Office of Student Financial Assistance. So if you think about a federal grant, 
And we're usually funded for seven years from 2018 through 2025, goes through to the Department of Higher Ed. And then we administer it throughout the Commonwealth. And as you look on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the map of the Commonwealth. You can see the seven districts that we're a part of. Uh, we're up in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And a lot of my information today is going to center on both statewide, but then we're going to zero in on Lawrence, where we make a tremendous impact. Um, then we're, to, we're in Lowell, East Boston, New Bedford, Worcester, Holyoke, and Springfield. So those are the seven districts that we serve. And we serve a total of 6,300 students throughout the Commonwealth. Again, Gear Up is a national program. So we're in just about every state in the country. Uh, but in Massachusetts, we're at about 6,300 students. Uh, we're in 16 urban schools um, and in the, within those seven districts. And typically, we have a middle school that feeds into a larger high school, a comprehensive high school. Lawrence is a prime example where we serve students at Spark Middle School and then who typically matriculate onto uh, the comprehensive campus. And then they go on to, to various campuses, including uh, our dear friends in Northern Essex. Um, our mission at Gear Up is to help our students uh, prepare for success. And that success is going to be while they're in middle school, we're going to help them explore the options for careers, uh, get them excited about a high school transition, uh, and really getting to know who they are. Uh, we're going to help them prepare for early high school uh, and making sure that they understand what a grade point average is and help them with some of the services there. And then as they prepare for life after high school, we're going to make sure that they are ready to take advantage of the opportunities. Uh, whether that's post-secondary education, a two-year, four-year trade school, uh, whatever it may be, we want to help them prepare for it. Next slide, please. Now, if I zero in on Lawrence specifically to give you a sense of what Gear Up looks like uh, within the Lawrence community, we serve a total in 2021, we served a total of um, 764 students uh, at those two schools. Uh, and some of our outcomes that we're very proud of is, especially during the pandemic in a very difficult uh, year that many of us adapted to, we had over 317 students who attended some type of a college visit or college uh, student shadowing. Most of those were virtual. Uh, we, had, we assisted 444 students who attended workshops on college or in some way related to career or just a, a helping them visualize a future beyond uh, formal their, their, their K-12 experience. And we assisted with 297 students on financial aid and counseling. I'm going to dig into that data a little bit more specifically because there's a crisis and an opportunity around the financial aid and counseling. And when we talk about FAFSA completion, which is a huge indicator uh, on what a student's going to do post, uh, after their post-secondary experience, uh, after their high school experience, uh, you're going to talk, going to talk about the financial aid uh, counseling, and I would I want to underscore how long it took just to complete one FAFSA, which is typically a very involved process. But when you're talking about doing it virtually, you're going to hear about some extreme uh, examples of what Lawrence did uh, and what we did alongside the Lawrence community. And we had over 408 uh, students that we assisted with academic planning and career counseling. And what you're looking at is some pictures of our Gear Up students throughout the years uh, at various districts who participated in our program. Thank you. Next slide. So if, as we were talking to Carol and Megan and they asked us, what are some of the challenges that you're experiencing uh, with regards to COVID? Uh, some of the data, and this data is from DESI. Uh, I attended a principal's information session in August that the Department of Early uh, and Secondary Education hosted, elementary and secondary education hosted, and these were the statistics that really shocked many of us. We saw it, and I'm sure as I talked to Lane, he's living it, he and his team are, uh, and I'm sure Allison is being impacted by it, as all of our students are. So Massachusetts Public Colleges, it just shows the enrollment drop from the fall of 2019 to 2020. And we're looking at enrollment of new students. And you can see UMass system-wide was down just under 10%. State universities was off by just under 15%. And then you look at some of the, you know, community colleges, 23%. But then when you start looking at it broken out by segment, you really zero in on African-American students, um, enrollment off by a third. And you see, and you think about how long did it take for us to make the gains in the Commonwealth yeah. with this population? And then you look at the impact of one year where the, the, the college enrollment dropped off by a third, that is dramatic. 
You look at our Latinx students, off by almost 23, almost 20, almost a quarter. Uh, so overall, you're talking about some real deeply concerning statistics when you talk about um, college enrollment. And then you map that out a decade later and you say, what can we do to mitigate this trend? The last thing we'd want to do is have a lost generation of students um, and, and the impact that, that comes from that. So I just wanted to share that data with you uh, and I'll go into the next slide. Um, I did want to warn you all, by the way, just a side note when we were doing housekeeping, if you hear a cat in the background, my little cat, Jet Black, he loves Zooms. So just so you know, uh, he may even pop up and make a, a guest appearance. So, you know, I hope you enjoy cats as much as I do. So just in time for Halloween, I guess. So uh, another challenge that we witnessed around FAFSA was around FAFSA completion. And this data, again, was from the uh, Department of Early and Secondary Education, one of their slides. I thought it was really important. On the left-hand side, you can see that uh, John Pape, his data was on the class of 2021, and he's from Brown University. They do tremendous research on college and career readiness. And again, this was data was presented. You can see that first bullet just talks about the initial analysis of FAFSA completion declines, and, and these are some of the findings. We know FAFSA is a tremendous early indicator of college enrollment. We know also the impact of FAFSA completion dropped in March of 2020 and continued to lag uh, for the class of 2021. FAFSA completion takes time. It takes effort. It takes a lot of uh, individual attention because we're dealing with taxes. We're dealing with um, a whole lot of work. That, that is labor intensive. And when you don't have a student or family in front of you, it is really difficult to, to, to really corral that. The declines, looking where it says updated findings, uh, they were concentrated among low-income students. Uh, that's of concern. The pattern was uh, persisted among race and gender subgroups, except Asian, stu Asian students. And the completion gap for low-income students um, it, it didn't close for some of the, the, the schools that we tried to target, but there were some exceptions. And that very last bullet, it may be cut off, it said, in a few targeted schools, completion rates held or even steadily increased. I don't know about you, but that's where my eyes get drawn is in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of this fall off, who got it right? Who did something? Who innovated? Who pivoted? And I want to share with you in my next slide, Lawrence, Massachusetts, and, the, and, and their school district was one of the organizations that did just that. Uh, what you're looking at here is that data uh, that I just described about FAFSA completions from 2019 to 2021. You can see on the left, it goes 19, 20, uh, 21, yellow, green, and blue, respectively. And you can see, I'm going to sort of focus on the Black and Hispanic students predominantly, because you can see those are the sh sharper drop-offs. Again, this is where the Commonwealth is going to have to uh, develop interventions um, to address this. Otherwise, we're looking at some real challenging years ahead. So I'll go to the next slide. I just wanted to show you more of that data. So let's talk about the opportunities because throughout every challenge, we know that there are, there's always an opportunity. And I'm gonna highlight data from our Gear Up program. Our Gear Up students uh, attend Lawrence High School. They're a subset of the Lawrence High School. We, can't, we don't serve all students at Lawrence High School, but I'm gonna show you data on our seniors who, uh, who are part of the program. We serve 244 Gear Up uh, Lawrence High School seniors um, in 2021, class of 2021. 210 of them, completed their FAFSA. Folks, that is a 91.3% FAFSA completion rate through some of the most challenging times that we could have imagined. And the question that you might be asking is, how did that happen? Why? Well, in 2021, Lawrence, the community, uh, the, the school, the administration, uh, our friends at, at many of the partner organizations on here, like Northern Essex, um, and some of the other or agencies that are represented here, we all came together. There were some grant, state grant dollars that were uh, uh, available. And literally, our Lawrence team with their administrators went door to door through COVID. Uh, we sat down in people's living rooms with our families, completed their FAFSAs. Our families were overwhelmed by the commitment and dedication uh, of administrators coming, knocking on their door, and literally completing their FAFSAs with them. I, I likened it to almost like a triage. Uh, and almost like an ambulance, a FAFSA EMT service. 
And there's a lot of possibility to expand this because the bottom line is no one took no for an answer. And it eliminated a lot of the waste of the time of getting taxes. And I forgot this and I couldn't get that. We were like, well, here we are in your living room. We had somebody back at the office and we did a lot of remotely. Very innovative. That's, that was a huge success. Um, so I, I wanted to share that and I'll move on to the next slide. Another partnership uh, through this virtual world, and you're gonna hear more about it from, from later presenters, but our GEAR program, we just recently um, solidified a relationship with the New England Revolution. And now I'm looking not only at our high school seniors, but I'm also looking at our students at all grade levels. And the question is, how can we continue to engage them? Because engagement was a huge issue through this virtual period of time. Attendance got expanded to engagement because just because you're on a Zoom doesn't mean you're engaged as a learner. So we wanted to look at different opportunities to energize and, and really look at college and for readiness. So we partnered with the New England Revolution recently. We did a virtual event with them. This is one of many partnerships that we've been able to expand. They were very eager to look for organizations like Gear Up to partner with because they were struggling to reach out and connect with students. So we were able to capitalize on that and leverage that relationship. So we did a virtual event with them. We had speakers and we promoted the many careers. Now we're talking about college and career readiness. We talked about sales, marketing, project management, all the careers that go into supporting a franchise like that. Folks don't know that they're electricians, plumbers, uh, doctors, statisticians, the whole universe of careers that exist, you can do that for an organization like the Revolution or the Patriots or the Celtics. So we just use, we utilize them as just a gateway to talk about what are you excited about? If you're excited about sports, you can connect that to a very exciting career for yourself. Um, and we had a, a tremendous event. It was just very exciting. And I just wanted to highlight the fact that there are partnerships out there that are looking for us and looking for ways to assist within the community uh, and so this is just one of the many examples that I wanted to highlight. Um, so I'll go to the next slide and I think I'm winding things down here. All to say, uh, in summary, we are proud partners of, of those who are gonna speak after me. None of us can do it by ourselves and we've all been challenged, but out of this challenge, there's tremendous innovation uh, that's come from it. And we look forward to continuing to assist our students and, and, and help them move forward toward their, their desires and their dreams, no matter what that is. So thank you for the, your time. Oh, Carol, you're on mute. Thank you, Robert. And particularly I was, I was saying for elevating some of the data um, in the racial and digital, um, in the digital inequities. I think that it's a, a important part of the story here and it'll certainly continue on through the next parts of our conversation and then we'll open things up after Lane finishes for conversation. So now I'm going to turn things over to Allison. Allison Caffrey, um, are you going to drive your own deck, Allison? Uh, Megan, if you have the slides handy, that would be great. If not, I can do it. Sure, just give me one minute to pull them up. Okay. I'll just introduce myself while you're doing that. Um, I'm Allison, it's nice to meet and see you all. Um, I was born and raised in Andover and worked um, at Esperanza Academy and served on the board in Lawrence um, for a couple of years. So Essex County is near and dear to my heart for sure. Um, my current role is National Director of Development for a college and access organization called Let's Get Ready. Um, but prior to being in this role for the past year and a half or so, I was the New England Executive Director, so overstock programs and fundraising um, for our work in New England, um, which was, uh, was and is primarily in Massachusetts and Maine. Um, all right, the next slide. Oh, actually, the next one, and then we'll go back to that one. <laughs> at the matter of order a little. Um, so a little bit about Let's Get Ready. Um, as I mentioned, we're a college access and success organization um, serving just over 13,000 students. Um, we say nationally, uh, our, our footprint is predominantly in the Northeast from Philadelphia to Maine, um, but we have some pretty big growth plans um, and our students go to college all over the country. So um, you'll see we're in 856 zip codes across 22 states. Our model is um, based on near peer mentoring. Um, and so we serve students in 11th grade through college graduation and all of our mentors are college students themselves. 
um, and 75% of them um, have gone through the Let's Get Ready program or come from similar backgrounds. And so they're really able to quickly forge um, really strong relationships with the students in, in the program because they're going through the same things and um, you know, uh, often come from similar backgrounds. Um, we have a very low barrier to entry. Um, basically, students who are interested in attending college is the requirement. Um, there are no academic requirements. You don't need a recommendation or a referral. Um, we give priority to students who are from um, low-income households, which we measure through um, in high school through eligibility for free or reduced lunch, um, and in college, Pell eligibility, um, and, and or students who will be first in their first generation in their family to attend college. Those are both um, self-identification uh, boxes that they check on our very short application. Um, and oftentimes we're able to serve um, all students who are interested, um, but we do give priority to, to those two underrepresented groups. Um, we have sort of hubs in Greater Boston and New York. Um, in Greater Boston, uh, we have an office right in the city, and then we've served um, communities sort of around the 495 uh, corridor. Um, in Essex County, we had programs back when we were in person um, for part of our programs in Lawrence and Lynn. Um, and also a really strong partnership with Salem State, um, where a lot of our students would attend for college. Um, next slide. Or sorry, go back a slide. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, so a little bit about our program model. Um, as I mentioned, we serve students from 11th grade through college graduation. We've um, actually extended that this year through six years of college um, rather than four, which is standard for a lot of the students that we serve. Um, we start with our access program, which targets high school juniors. Um, the hook really for a lot of them is to increase their SAT scores, whether they've taken the SAT and want to increase their score, whether they um, have it scheduled but haven't taken it and just want to make sure they're prepared. Um, you know, it's the SAT is a moving target at the moment, which I'll get into later. But for a lot of students, um, it's something they really associate with college admissions. Maybe they've heard from someone they have to get, you know, X score to be able to go to college at all or to be able to go to a specific college. Um, so it, it often works as a really good way to get students in the door um, and, and signed up for this bigger mentoring program and, and college preparation. Once students um, are in 12th grade, they're part of our transition program um, and our transition and success programs. Um, the success program serves college students both have two pathways. Um, and uh, the students get to, to select the level of support that they want and need. So there's a lot of agency given to students, um, which we find is really successful. Um, you know, when I was working at, at Esperanza, which is a middle school, we just told the kids what to do and they sort of had to do it. But 17, 18, 19 year olds, I think really respond um, to, you know, being, being part of the process um, and getting to choose, you know, do you want a dedicated coach who's gonna check in with you a couple times a week or a couple times a month? Um, you know, to really help you stay on track, or do you just need some, some reminders and to be part of a cohort that's going to have access to a coach and a mentor if you need one. Um, but for the most part, you know, again, it's, it's sort of nudge programming to keep you on track towards your, your college going milestones. So the transition program serves students in 12th grade. And then um, once they've uh, matriculated in college, they become part of our success program. Um, and the mentoring part of the success program is really concentrated on the first and second years of college, which are sort of the, the most high risk. Oftentimes, if students get through the second year into the third, um, they're on pretty good track um, to make it to graduation. So we really focus the, the intensive mentoring on those first two years, but they remain in the program through college graduation. Um, and again, I would just point to the fact that um, I described it as sort of a choose your own adventure in terms of the students being able to select the level of support that they want and need. Um, and the, the value of near peers as mentors, um, you know, really empowering um, our mentors uh, as, as the program implementers who are making a, a positive impact on their community and, and paying it back to the classes behind them. Um, but also just the, the ability of um, near peers to forge those really strong relationships in a really quick way um, is really key to, key to our program and, and something that I think is pretty unique. All right, now I think we're going two slides ahead. Thanks. Um, so in terms of outcomes, um, you know, Robert shared those really jarring statistics in terms of the drop in enrollment. Um, we were really uh, proud, although the work is obviously not done, that we only saw a 2% drop in enrollment 
um, from 88% to 86% from the high school class of 2019 to the high school class of 2020. Um, we'll get our 20 high school class of 21 enrollment figures from the National Student Clearinghouse um, in a couple of months. So it will be interesting to see um, you know, what that change is. Um, but you know, as you can see from these charts, the, um, the college enrollment rate, even with that small drop, uh, is still above you know, peers from similar backgrounds. We're not, um, not enrolled in Let's Get Ready's program. Um, Another, another one to point to is our um, college graduation rate, which is sort of the ultimate goal of Let's Get Ready. Again, we measure through six years um, and our success program in its current form is really only six years old. Um, and so this is uh, the first class that had uh, this intensive support um, through college. And so we're, we're excited um, by that 68% number, um, but, you know, and that's more than double students from similar backgrounds but it's still below um, students from, I think, the, the top quarter or top, top quintile um, of income. And, and so our work continues until that gap fully closes. Um, next slide. And so just thinking about some of the, the challenges and opportunities ahead, and, and a lot of them, you know, it's a challenge and an opportunity wrapped up in one. Um, and so one thing that we're keeping an eye on that is ongoing COVID or not COVID, um, is navigating the changing landscape of higher education. Um, as I mentioned, the, the SAT is a bit of a moving target at the moment, um, but we think you know, our goal is to have SAT prep be a service that we offer. And so if that is helpful to students, if it gets them in the door, if it opens up merit scholarships, um, if it helps them test out of remedial classes in community colleges, um, you know, the SAT is very imperfect. Um, and, and we as a staff all acknowledge that, but it is you know, still a tool and a resource for, for a lot of situations and, and can help students. And so we wanna make sure that we're providing um, support if, if they um, you know, choose to go that path. Um, and then I think you know, seeing remote learning is both a challenge and an opportunity. Um, the digital divide, as Carol mentioned, is still there. Um, you know, access to both the devices that students need as well as the, the connectivity a quiet space to work and be on, on Zoom classes, um, you know, is really something that uh, we're helping our students navigate. Um, and, and one of the things about near peer mentors is that, um, you know, they're 20, 21, 22 themselves. And so um, not that any of us have all the answers, but they definitely don't have all the answers. And so a big part of our program is helping coaching and training the mentors to help students navigate the issues that they're facing and connect with resources rather than solving things for them. And so that has really been a focus. Um, the, the digital divide and remote learning has been a focus um, in terms of students navigating that and making sure that they have what they need to, to participate in class and, and stay on track. Um, and then sort of related to the, the FAFSA um, completion rates, really looking towards affordability, which I think is, is even more front and center than it was before. Um, and the extra considerations around affordability um, and the sort of quote, full college experience. Um, you know, a lot of schools are still charging the on-campus price, even if students are, are sitting in their, their parents' home or their you know, bedroom um, and attending classes. And so, you know, sort of helping them weigh the pros and cons um, even further in terms of affordability. Um, and then we've done a lot of work, especially this past year, on um, culturally responsive um, mentoring and making sure that our students really feel supported um, and are uh, feel safe, feel comfortable, um, are you know able to bring them their full selves to campus, um, and making sure that uh, in the ways that we are able to leverage our position um, and, and working with colleges to sort of look past, um, you know, some surface level diversity initiatives um, and really make sure that that support for underrepresented students is, is um, front and center on campuses. Um, another thing that will continue um, through and beyond the pandemic is keeping up with evolving student needs. Um, you know, there are a lot that have been highlighted over the past year or two. Um, the communities that we serve, the students that we serve, um, there's no question that they are facing a disproportionate negative impact um, of the pandemic. Um, you know, higher job loss, higher um, negative health impacts and, and family and community death, um, as well as financial challenges and mental health challenges. 
Um, so there are a lot that is on students' plates and especially students who are you know, navigating college, um, first in their family to navigate college or have other responsibilities at home um, or personal responsibilities that, that middle and higher income students um, don't deal with. Um, and so we are making sure that our curriculum is um, uh, dynamic and responsive um, and that our coaches are staying on top of um, you know, what our students are really facing and what support they need. Um, and I think similar to what Robert was talking about in terms of um, career exploration and uh, readiness, you know, I think as a whole, our industry uh, has continued to move the goalposts in a positive way where um, organizations like Let's Get Ready really started as college access organizations. The goal is to get students into college and then they were on their own. Um, and I think pretty quickly folks, um, probably not quickly enough, but quickly realized that that could not be the end goal, um, that students were ending up with debt and no degrees. Um, and it was doing almost more damage than, than good. So, um, you know, like a lot of organizations, Let's Get Ready um, evolved into a college success organization as well. Um, I mentioned that our success program has been around for, for six years um, and that continues to improve and evolve. But now we're thinking um, you know, beyond graduation, what does career launch look, look like for our students? Um, and how can we, you know, without creating mission drift or um, you know, trying to reinvent the wheel that other organizations are doing a great job, with, how can we make sure that they're um, you know, ready to launch their careers and are supported in those first couple of years as they, as they get going. Um, and then finally, I, I just wanted to mention that we have just launched um, a big new strategic plan over the next four years. Um, the demand for our program, um, you know, I, I mentioned that we can often meet a lot of the students um, that sign up, whether or not they're first gen or from low income backgrounds. Um, but we are now at a point where um, the demand from partners and from students themselves is, um, you know, we're pressing on our capacity. Um, and so we are in, in major growth mode um, to, to almost double the number of students served um, by 2025. And that will be a combination um, of a couple different strategies. One is to grow our footprint nationally to, to expand beyond the Northeast. Um, but the other is to really deepen our presence in the communities that we're in. And I think one of the um, real advantages of our program being fully virtual now is we can reach students sort of around the communities that we've served in the past. Um, so I mentioned we, we used to run in-person programs in Lawrence and Lynn. And if a student couldn't attend you know, from 5 to 8 p.m. at Lynn Classical, then they couldn't be part of Let's Get Ready. Um, and that was, that was the only access point. Students had to come in for our SAT prep program we had plans to, to expand entry points so that they could join at um, any level of the program. That has been uh, greatly accelerated by COVID and the virtual shift. Um, and so now students can enroll you know, 11th, 12th grade or college, um, and they can attend and, and participate virtually. And so you know, we're looking forward to expanding our footprint in places like Essex County, where um, you know, we were really only serving sort of Greater Lawrence and, and Greater Lynn um, until until this past year, um, and then as I mentioned, you know we'll be able to enroll students directly um, through our through our entry points, but also partner with um, colleges, universities, um, whole school districts, and and other um, nonprofits serving similar populations. So it's a it's a big plan, but uh, we think it it meets the moment and it's it's definitely necessary, and so we're excited to embark on it. Um, so thanks for your time. Thanks, Allison. Um, as Robert noted, I'm I'm really impressed with the the two percent drop, um, and I think you know that speaks to the commitment of the organization to reduce barriers and evolve as you understand students and the changing landscape. Um, so thank thank you so much for that. Um, so now I'm going to turn things over to Lane, and then after Lane, we'll have an opportunity for Q and A. Thanks, Carol. So hi, everybody. I'm Lane Glenn. I'm the president of Northern Essex Community College. Um, I know a couple of you, most of you I don't. Uh, I've been president at Northern Essex now for 10 years. We have campuses in Lawrence uh, and in Haverhill. We serve uh, around 5,000 students in our credit programs, another few thousand uh, in our non-credit programs, our workforce development, uh, continuing education programs. Um, and we are one of 15 community colleges around the state of Massachusetts 
that collectively serve about 100,000 undergraduates uh, each year. So a sizable proportion of the undergraduates uh, in the state uh, are at our community colleges. Um, thank you uh, to Robert and to Allison uh, for some fantastic data points. Um, I will try to complement uh, the ones that you just provided and, and not go over the same ones where they may appear in my session here. Um, you've built a marvelous foundation here. It's good to have you in the ecosystem. Um, let me start off by stating the obvious. I think everyone on this call knows this, uh, that geography is destiny in a whole lot of ways. Um, and by uh, thanking the, the Essex County Community Foundation for some data points that I'm about to share uh, from their marvelous repository called Impact Essex County. Um, one of the hats that I wear for the last several years, uh, I've been the chairperson for the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission's uh, Comprehensive Economic Development Strategies Group. Um, every few years uh, as a regional planning commission, uh, we're required to develop a, a regional plan for economic development in the area. Uh, the most recent plan we developed uh, is, is called Embracing Resilience and Equity uh, for a Prosperous Region. And one of the things we know, um, certainly, and it's been tested the past year and a half, um, you know, this is a region that has demonstrated its resilience in lots of ways. And it's a region uh, in which um, we have a, an abundance of blessings, right, by just any standard you can think of, uh, this area, this region, the Merrimack Valley and Essex County more broadly, um, is a prosperous part of the world, right? A, a wonderful place to live, high wages, relatively speaking, and employment level of education is off the charts. Um, certainly as it compares to the national landscape, you know, a rich history of uh, culture and all of these things. And not everyone in our county enjoys the same access to those resources. Uh, I realize that I'm very much preaching to the choir here. This is a group that knows this intimately. Um, and for this session today around college readiness and what this looks like, especially during a pandemic, I thought it might be important to return to some of these data points. Now, it wasn't that long ago that I put these slides together. It was just a couple of months ago for a different keynote presentation. I narrowed them a bit for today. And uh, since I put them together, we have the results of the new census. Uh, some of these have shifted even further in the direction that I'm about to share with you. Um, they're all still accurate and uh, have only grown in the direction that they've been moving. Uh, and you'll see what I mean in just a moment. So again, many thanks to ECCF for Impact Essex County, these data points. It's a marvelously rich repository of these things. So when you look at the changes in, in race and ethnicity um, from the prior census and over the past few years here in Essex County, um, you notice uh, some obvious differences, right? The county as a whole uh, you look at the increase in the Hispanic population, the Black or African American population, the Asian population, and the flat uh, line uh, around the white population in the county. This is a county that is very much in terms of population fueled by uh, immigration, uh, by uh, interstate uh, mobility, um, and it is a county that is growing increasingly diverse in terms of people of color as residents, and that certainly plays out even uh, deeper uh, by community when you look at some of the gateway cities uh, in Essex County, Lawrence and Lynn and so forth. Um, and of course, when you look at the, the people who are living in poverty in the county by race and ethnicity, um, who they are and where they are, uh, you see similar features, right? Uh, with the Hispanic population, the Black or African American population having certainly much higher concentrations of people living in poverty followed by the Asian and finally the white population. And there again, you can see how that plays out by community. Um, you know, where places uh, like Lawrence and Lynn and other gateway cities have even higher concentrations of those populations. Similarly with unemployment, um, you can see the same trends uh, with black or African-American residents in the county leading in unemployment trends followed by Hispanic um, and then much farther behind Asian and white. Now this has shifted dramatically. Obviously these percentages shot up to nearly 20% uh, at the height of the pandemic uh, and are settling down once again, um, closer to that 5.5% rate that we saw pre-pandemic today. And there are still enormous variances by community and by population within those communities. Here's the one that's of greatest interest to us on the call today, I suppose, uh, although it fuels everything else I just showed you. The education level of adults by race and ethnicity, look at that. The difference between Hispanic residents of Essex County and white residents of Essex County, 30%. Look at Hispanic residents in Lawrence, the lowest in the state of Massachusetts. It's tied with Holyoke, actually. 
um, and the difference there. So one of the primary missions of my college, one of my primary personal missions, and I've said this publicly for a number of years now in lots of different venues, if there's one thing I can do before I'm finished being president of this college, it's change what you're looking at right now on the screen. Um, and the rest of this is designed to follow that. So you've, uh, some of this uh, was contained in what Robert and Allison shared with you. Certainly college completion outcomes by race and ethnicity vary. Um, with uh, Asian students tending to fare the best in terms of completion, followed by white and a big drop off before you get to Hispanic and black students. Here in Massachusetts, we are the most educated state in the nation. You likely know that. We have a higher proportion of adults with bachelor's degrees than any other state. Washington, D.C. is a little bit ahead of us, but they're not a state, so we don't count them, right? Um, we're the most educated state, and usually that's good. We also have high high school graduation rates, high rates of people going to college. Uh, graduating from public colleges, all of those things uh, tend to be very positive. From the college's perspective, and by the way, the things I'm saying about Northern Essex apply in similar ways to pretty much any other community college you can look at in the state, although they have different student populations. Um, like those uh, indicators I shared with you a minute ago, uh, the populations in the communities that we serve, so Haverhill, Lawrence, Methuen, uh, and others uh, are increasingly diverse, right? Haverhill, it, 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 it has come as a more recent uh, trend in the city of Haverhill that the overall population actually in the last census, it's, a, it's above 20% Latino and more than a third of the students in the public schools uh, now are Latino. Um, <clears throat> the enrollment in Lawrence Public Schools has increased a whopping 26% over the past nearly decade. Lawrence is a young city, right? Uh, the Latino population in America in general is a younger population. Um, that uh, informs what we do as educators. Um, and thankfully, during that time, since the schools went into receivership about a decade ago, uh, the high school graduation rate has improved, the dropout rate has been reduced dramatically, um, and there are more students coming in to the point where the district is you know, looking for classroom space. Um, and uh, thankfully, the number of students graduating from the high school and enrolling at Northern Essex immediately after Right. Thank you, organizations like Let's Get Ready. Thank you, organizations like Gear Up. Um, you know, working in a, a, a city like Lawrence to help students and families get attuned to the college-going experience. Right. Uh, and of course, early college uh, is a huge uh, benefit, uh, especially to lower income uh, and students of color in our gateway cities. Uh, about two-thirds of the students statewide who are enrolled in early college programs now are Black or Latino. That's enormous. Those students are earning college credits while they're in high school. They're more likely to go to college and they're more likely to complete, right? A little more good news before we round a corner. Um, at Northern Essex, our uh, Latino student success rate is slightly better than the statewide average. That's a good thing because we have the largest proportion of Latino students of any college in Massachusetts. So it's a good thing, thankfully, that you know we're, we're above average. We wanna be even more than that. Um, similar with our retention rate, slightly above average, um, and our gap, and I'm coming back to this uh, during COVID times, pre-COVID, uh, our gap narrowed to 5%. And by that, I mean the rate at which our Latino students and our white students are graduating, transferring, staying retained, those things that we look at as measures of, of success. Now, the bad news here, uh, unfortunately, um, the gap between Latino and white college degree attainment in the state of Massachusetts is huge. One of the largest in the nation, 33% gap. Um, Out of his blind spot. Uh, sorry, what? Oh, that may have been an accident. Okay, okay. <laughs> a large gap between our Latino and white students. Um, so really only a few states have a higher gap than that. Um, when you look at subpopulations within uh, our Latino and white students, the gap between, for example, Latino male students and white female students Wow, right? Um, when, we dis, when, when we look at this data inside the college, we're constantly disaggregating it so that we can provide you know, specific services to specific students um, as they are needed because not every student, not every student demographic is the same within those demographics, there are differences. So this is the kind of thing that we're constantly disaggregating in order to come up with the best ways to close those gaps. Why do we need to close them? Well, look at this. The difference between high school graduating classes in 2002 and fast forward to 2032, a few years from now, all right, a decade from now, but it'll be here before we know it, 
Um, in 2002, 82% of those graduating high school students were white. In 2032, the projection is just over half, 56%. If we don't do something about this challenge now, um, we are going to have an even bigger headache uh, in the future. Us, the students, the families, we're talking about a huge portion of the population that if not educated in areas that are needed by the workforce um, in order to accomplish uh, at least middle-class occupations, living wages, benefits, and those kinds of things, will leave an enormous part of the population uh, outside and uh, employers deeply dissatisfied, right? So for my part as a college president, um, some of you may be familiar with my blog, Running the Campus. I write articles in magazines and newspapers and get regional and national attention specifically for community colleges and the kinds of things that we're talking about here. Um, this is a graphic that I've used a lot over the last couple of years because as much as anything, it starkly represents why we have some of the challenges we have for community college students. So nationally, community colleges educate larger proportions of low-income students, first-generation students, students of color, students with disabilities, veterans. You pick your underserved or at-risk student population and community colleges serve a larger proportion of them with the smallest amount of funding. Right, So that column on the left, that enormous blue stack, is a private selective uh, research university, you know, your MITs. Um, the orange one there is your public selective flagships, your UMass Amherst's. Um, the $30,000 one there, private university, say Marymount College. Vocational high schools, any of them, Whittier, Greater Lawrence, um, Essex Tech, any of those. Um, the public university, Salem State University, K-12, whatever happens to be in your neighborhood. And finally, community colleges like Northern Essex, the per student expenditures at each of these places, the only segment of education that spends less per student, unfortunately, is early childhood education. Um, yeah, so you know, once you start going to school, um, the community college has the least amount to spend on our students and our students tend to have the greatest needs. So uh, sort of pull this all together. What have been some of our challenges through the COVID-19 pandemic? These are the things that I've been writing about and advocating for. Um, Allison and, and Robert both mentioned this in, in their presentations, the digital divide. A few months into the pandemic, I was talking to Cynthia Paris, the superintendent of Lawrence Public Schools about this issue because you know if, if her students are experiencing it, that, that uh, affects our students as well. She estimated at that time that about 30% of the families in Lawrence did not have reliable in-home access to, to broadband. Um, that, by the way, differs from what nearly any mayor or town manager might say about their town or city. <laughs> um, we have found a lot of differences, and, and ECCF has been working uh, hard on this over the past couple of years. Um, there are different uh, um, ways of interpreting uh, this challenge uh, in cities and towns. And while some cities and towns might like to think it's not as big of a challenge, it is. Um, for any family earning under $50,000, that proportion uh, is not unusual. 25% or so of those families likely do not have uh, reliable broadband internet access in the home. While Verizon, uh, Comcast, the providers uh, have made some accommodation during COVID, um, they're not committed to continuing that accommodation post COVID. And I don't say that lightly. I've had direct conversations with each of them. Um, I have been in conversation with uh, Senator Markey, who's a strong proponent for this, and Senator Warren and our various uh, federal delegation members to seek funding at the federal level, as well as some creative ideas at the local and, and regional level. Merrimack Valley Planning Commission, we're going at this thing in every possible way we can. Yes, it's been identified as you know, one of the components of infrastructure uh, in the proposed bill that's out there on infrastructure. Who knows what'll happen with that? Whatever the outcome, this is a, a challenge that needs to be addressed um, because it starts in K-12 and it persists into colleges. I'll tell you a couple of ways we've tried to address it in just a moment. Housing and food insecurity, Northern Essex and all the colleges, all the community colleges in the state participated in a statewide survey of community college students a year and a half or so ago uh, that revealed something we knew and were able to put some numbers to, which is about a third of our students each year report being housing or food insecure. Um, we started a food pantry. We work with the Greater Boston Food Bank. Um, Senator Warren was on our campus a few months ago visiting the food bank in order to highlight this uh, challenge at community colleges in anticipation of some legislation uh, she's promoting at the federal level 
um, that would provide college students greater, more reliable access to SNAP benefits, things like that. Um, it became an even bigger deal during the pandemic. And as I mentioned, that equity gap. While we were happy that it narrowed to 5% pre-pandemic, it opened back up to 12. No, <laughs> just no, right? Um, we're doing everything we can to reverse that trend. Um, some potentially, oh, these are some of the ways that, by the way, uh, we've tried to address some of these issues during the pandemic. Uh, we extended Wi-Fi out into our parking lots. We used some CARES Act funding to purchase laptops and make them available to all of our students. Um, along the lines of the, the near peer uh, mentors that Allison was explaining, um, we've employed uh, NECC student ambassadors uh, to work directly with students. They're standing six feet apart, you'll notice in that picture, because we took it uh, several months ago. <laughs> Um, and lastly, what are some pandemic opportunities emerging for us? Um, Allison hit on a couple of these. Uh, they're similar for us as well. We've got some expanded instructional delivery options coming out of the pandemic. Some students and faculty who didn't think that online education was their thing discovered, maybe against their will initially, that it is their thing. There's some flexibility there. They're better at it than they thought they were. Don't get me wrong. A lot of people also discovered, no, I can't do this. Um, and we have entire new degree programs now available that weren't available before the pandemic. More hybrid offerings, combination of in-person and online, um, more competency-based offerings. Um, one of the challenges uh, for lower income populations of students is the longer it takes to complete a credential, the more opportunities there are for life to get in the way uh, and to sidetrack them. So when we can combine things like prior learning assessment to give credit for something somebody's already learned, with competency-based education. Show me what you can, what you know, and you don't have to take as long to finish a class, then we can get them through more rapidly. And those are things that we implemented more of during COVID. Um, certainly, you know, from a operations perspective, uh, remote work options for the college. And I mentioned this in this context because that funding piece, we don't spend a lot. Our salaries are not high. It's challenging for us to recruit uh, from out of state or sometimes from across the state uh, to the jobs that we have available. So when we can offer things to sort of sweeten the pot, we do. And certainly improve student services in the form of you know, online admissions and registration and remote advising, um, things that uh, we, we grew during the pandemic um, that will hang on to post-pandemic to help our students. So thank you for the opportunity to share that with you. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Lane. That was great. And thank you again for your commitment to the closing of gaps and the pivot. Um, and I think so much of this illustrate and, and elevating Impact Essex County, which in many ways was our collective gift to the community for purposes just like this. And it sort of illustrates to me the themes that came out, um, the interconnectedness ac across the work. I think if you were to join a mental health conversation or you know, housing conversation, so many of the same inequities um, are consistent. And so at ECCF, we're just committed to that 30,000 foot ecosystem view, but the importance of the uh, folks on the ground doing the work, partnership, coalition building to study that and then collectively work together to move things at a population level scale. So it's important to do both. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and, um, uh, so thank you again to all three of you, but I'm gonna go ahead and we're just gonna go popcorn style um, of Q and A. And I'll just ask folks to use your little uh, emoji there to ask a question. Uh, and first out of the gate is, John Payson. So I'll go ahead and ask John to tee up hey guys, the question. Thanks very much. I know we don't have a lot of time. And so uh, I'm just going to take the next couple hours here to ask you some questions and talk about <laughs> and then let other people in. But um, I think it's really terrific uh, what Gear Up is doing. Uh, um, let's get ready as well. And uh, Lane, what you're doing up at uh, Northern Essex is really important, and particularly because the dislocation of COVID-19 has blown up a lot of the sort of traditional models. And I'm on the board of a college and uh, very resistant at present to their efforts to add things to try to fix that problem and pressing for coalition and collaboration with other organizations. You know, 80% of 
people in experiments when they're asked to improve something, add to it when not, and only 20% take something away. And I feel like we should make some space in order to collaborate with Let's Get Ready and, uh, and with Gear Up as gating uh, agencies to get um, kids into programs. I like the fact that you're going back earlier into the uh, education process. You know, in, in Detroit, three or four percent of kids uh, are reading at grade three level, uh, three or four percent. I know in 20 years, we're still going to be talking about racial equity issues because those kids are not going to make it unless there's an intervention to help get them into these, uh, uh, into these other programs. So, um, uh, Allison, in particular, uh, talk to Carol, talk to ECCF. If you want to uh, expand in Essex County, you know, we've got uh, Merrimack, we've got Endicott, we've got Salem State, we've got Northern Essex. We can make a regional project, a demonstration project uh, for your work here with a little help from, uh, from you and your funders and do something on at a scale post-COVID that would really be compelling. I'll, I'll just stop talking now, but I think this is terrific. Thanks for putting it together, Carol. Thanks, John. Looking, looking forward to those conversations. <laughs> Thanks, John. Yeah. Okay, great. Kevin. Kevin Connolly. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, I should, I heard some great stuff today. Thank, thank you very much to the, to the speakers. Some good, uh, some thought-provoking things. Uh, I'm, I'm currently involved with a, a couple of smaller initiatives that are trying to facilitate you know, or pursuing the, the sort of underrepresented and importantly, I think, uninterested population into secondary education, whether it be community four year or even technical school. Um, and it's challenging. In other words, we have a demand issue. And yet when I listen here, uh, it seems like there's quite a bit of demand. So we're clearly not meeting our target market where we need to be meeting them. And I'm wondering if any of the speakers have any experience and or uh, observations about that problem, um, which is truthfully, it's our problem. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, and I'm also wondering whether or not the, you know, people who would be potentially or likely first year for first in generation college uh, applicants, uh, they don't care about SATs, you know, um, they're just not even thinking about secondary education at all. And how do we reach those people? Or, uh, as I was going to say, maybe that's just a flawed mission. And uh, I as a donor should be lining up behind entities such as we've heard today. If uh, <laughs> you know, if the uninterested are not interested, it's so difficult to reach them. And yet there's such uh, scaling and leverageability that can take place away from them that as a donor, I should be focused on that. So I don't know if anybody has any observations about that. I would okay. say that, that, oh, go ahead, Robert. Oh, sure, Allison. I'll be, I'll try to be brief. Kevin, I want to make sure I understand what your observation is before I respond. What I'm hearing you say is you're, you're identifying the fact that there's a, that there's a lot of, I'll say competition for higher ed, maybe in a traditional sense where you're hearing about students who may not see the value of pursuing a two, traditional two-year, four-year degree. Am I right? Am I on the track with that? Yeah, I mean, people that uh, are trying to, we're, we're trying to incentivize, encourage, or otherwise guide uninterested uh, high schoolers into yeah. a secondary education concept and we're having trouble with that. Money is not the answer. Understood. Scholarships don't seem to be getting any traction. Um, you know, yeah, they just- Would you mind I'll jump in on that? I mean, yeah, okay. I think I, I'm, I'm actually encouraged in, in a lot of ways because I'll, I'll talk about it from a gear perspective. So typically our program from the federal perspective has only been rewarded when students enrolled in two or four year institutions. Very narrow scope of success. So I think by its design, I think there were some flaws. So if a student was committed to going into the military service to serve our country, that was considered uh, not a success from Europe's perspective, although we've had many of our students go serve our country, come out, go back to college and, and raise a family and, and be taxpayers. And, and that's a success, but it wasn't documented as such. So from, again, from my organization's evolution in my time, I'm pleased to see that now our counselors still advise students, if you want to become a welder, even though it doesn't help my numbers, we're gonna do right by you and your family. 
So I want to just start by there because I also add the fact that our students are now exposed to opportunities that may not, again, fall through the traditional track. For example, this summer, we led a very popular uh, program about social media. Many of our students listed as their number one aspiration, whether it's, and some adults may see that it's silly, but hey, I want to be in social media. I may want to be an influencer. On its face value, a student may appear a middle schooler. That may seem like I want to be a, that might almost come off like I want to be an, a, an athlete. It's okay. The first thing I'm happy about is you have an aspiration. Okay. I'm not going to judge it. The question I now have is how can I build upon it? So to bring it back, Kevin, to your question is my question to my staff and my team is how can we make our students aspirations where they are, not judge them, not get misguided because the student is reflecting what they see as success. So how can I take that, uh, that initiative to say, yes, I'm interested in social media and how can I now expose you to the fact that you can do it professionally. You can do it for an organization. Oh, and that might connect you to a certification program through, through Lane's uh, institution, which they may not be aware of. Or you might even go on and be able to be a coder. So in summary, what I'm saying is the landscape have shift, has shifted. The question I have for myself is, am I equipped to meet some of the career opportunities that our students are A, seeing, B, uh, you know, whether they know or not preparing for, but it may not be in the traditional model that I was sort of reared in, or even that the, the feds reward me for, for approaching, but that's still not going to stop me coming back to, I'm going to need to innovate, I'm going to need to pivot, I'm going to need to partner, and I'm going to need to, to really meet my students where they are, but I would not say that there's a motivation gap or a motivation problem. It's a shift. That's what that's from my perspective, because our students are very highly motivated, but there's a lot of competition out there. They're eyeballs. They're not going to let you bore them anymore in a classroom. They are not going to give you their attention. So and you don't deserve it, quite honestly, as an educator. And that's what I'm challenging myself and my team to acknowledge. I'll thank you very much for that question. Thank you. Very informative. If I could add in terms of the demand and the need, you know, we know the demand is there. Um, you know, the, the data that Lane shared in terms of um, educational uh, attainment, um, you know, shows that those, those gaps are there, which is why in our scaling plans, we're really taking a two-pronged approach, you know, leaving enrollment open. If a student hears about it from their guidance counselor or their friend or whatever, they can just sign up, but also the partnership and cohort model. So, you know, working with um, organizations that serve students through high school graduation, but really want to make sure that they're supported to and through college, um, you know, creating a handoff model where that organization can then endorse us, enroll their whole cohort of 12th graders, um, and so they sort of automatically get the services. Um, and then once they're matched with a, a mentor, a near peer mentor, you know, there is a component of if you can see it, you can believe it. And so they sort of start to see themselves more in college students. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit of, you know, leading a horse to water, but also just providing the service like it's, um, you know, part of the educational journey. Um, and so we're, we're taking that sort of two-pronged approach to, to reach more students that we know need and want our support. If I can build on Robert and Allison's comments here, um, two things, you know, I mentioned earlier, geography is destiny. Um, and it plays out differently in the communities we serve. I was on the Zoom call earlier today with Mayor Holiday out of Newburyport. Uh, talking about various workforce needs in that city and how the college might be able to help them and college going populations. I will tell you um, the situation you described is not nearly as much of a challenge in a city like Newburyport where they are multi-generational college going families um, already attuned to that process uh, as it is in some of the other communities we serve. And then the second phrase I'll trot out here is it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and by that, I mean the relationships that we've formed over time in a city like Lawrence um, take some years sometimes to, to pay off and to change um, what you're describing, Kevin. Uh, and we're seeing that happen now. This fall, uh, Northern Essex Community College saw a 1% increase in enrollment. That sounds kind of small. It's the first increase in enrollment in seven years. Enrollment nationwide at community colleges has been on the decline. We have eroded less than others. Last fall, we had the smallest enrollment decline of any public college in Massachusetts. This fall, we may be one of the only colleges with a slight enrollment increase. That's due to the partnerships. It's due to the relationships. It's due to the marathon, not a sprint mentality in a city like Lawrence, where, as I mentioned, it's a youthful population. There's a lot of 
untapped what you just described, Kevin, a lot of untapped uh, college going potential in that city. Um, it, it, it takes time to get there. Please don't lose your patience. Thank you. Great, great question too. And um, I'll just say quickly too, so many of the themes, particularly Robert, what you addressed in terms of the willingness to pivot and in, innovate and meet people where they're at. I mean, it's so, <laughs> it's, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of vaccine equity work. It's the same, same kind of concepts just layered over and over again, again, across that. And then to speak to Lane's point, the commitment to the partnerships is really where that, that change happens. So um, Joan, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, I actually, I have one for Robert and one for Allison. My question for Robert, uh, he, you ended with talking about expanding more your program in Essex County. And I wanted to hear some more about your plans there or your ideas there. Thank you so much, Joan. And uh, thanks for your comments earlier in the chat. I'd say that uh, Gear Up is a federally funded program. And as our funds come from the Fed, the opportunity we have is through what's called matching contributions. So for every dollar we spend in, in Lawrence, uh, we have to match that dollar through, through in-kind contributions. So for example, if Lane and his team come over and do a presentation on, on the opportunities in career um, at, at Northern Essex, we can consider that as in-kind. When we occupy the space in Lawrence High School or at Spark Middle School, that's considered in-kind. So there's always an opportunity for in-kind and those can actually be literal dollars. So that's number one. Number two, I'd say the most innovative partnership in my program occurs at Lawrence High School. And it happens this way. The district made a commitment because they saw that it was unfair that some students got let's get ready services because they can't serve all the students there. Gear up, we can't serve all the students there. And they saw it as an appropriate equity challenge to say, how can we find funds within our, our, our district budget to give the same services to all Lawrence students? And they made a commitment and they literally mirrored uh, the Gear Up team and they basically hired a Lawrence Public um, uh, employee to, to report and work with Gear Up. And that model has been incredibly productive. It allowed us to expand our services. So just what you described, Joan, it really just, but it took immense collaboration. It took the evidence that we are getting results. Uh, and quite honestly, it's a model that we're trying to replicate statewide because, uh, because of its effectiveness. And again, I'm excited to find out, and I'm just going to use SAS as a window as I summarize. I can't wait till Desi does send out the data on which of those states did not drop off, which of those states, like Lane talked about, there were bright spots through this, through this pandemic. And boy, we are fools if we don't learn from them and build on those. That's a massive missed opportunity if we don't really dig in and find out who did what and why and how did those, how were those uh, services done in a really tough time and expand those. So I hope that gets at your, your answer, Joan, but thanks again for asking. Thank you. And for Allison, I, I wanted to ask you, um, as you expand your program, which sounds really interesting, what would you do? Um, would you take on more students um, or would you expand the uh, length of time with which you pair your students and the, their uh, mentors? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, the plans for growth are definitely to serve more students. Um, again, almost doubling from about 13,000 right now to 25,000 nationally. Um, but as I also mentioned, you know, we, we sort of have the, the traditional student four-year college cutoff. Um, I think I saw recently that non-traditional students are now the majority. Um, and most of the students that we serve you know, take four, five, six years to finish school, or they started a two-year school and then maybe take a year off and transfer. Um, and so there are all sorts of different pathways. Um, and especially with students who didn't enroll because of COVID or dropped out or stopped out. Um, and so what we're doing is um, to, to better serve those students is creating different curriculum channels um, to really make sure that the content meets students where they are um, and is responsive to their needs. And so you know, we will keep students in the program, um, you know, until they graduate or tell us to leave them alone. Um, but we anticipate, especially with our um, six year graduation rate being almost 70%, and that will continue to grow that most students will, um, will have graduated um, by that six year uh, timeframe. Thank you. 
Thanks. Thanks, Allison. Thanks, Joan, for your questions. Catherine. Go ahead and ask. I, I actually just have more of a comment. Um, I am a professor at Salem State. I'm an adjunct. This is my first year. Um, and I teach um, in the School of Education. I'm an early childhood um, math and science methods um, teach professor. Um, and I just, it was really interesting to listen to, you know, what has been the likely route for a number of my students to arrive in my classroom. Um, I think, Lane, your geography is destiny comment really resonated with me in a very specific present way, which is um, I'm thinking of two students that I have who live in Lynn. They are the primary breadwinners for their family. They are both 19 years old. Um, they both have another job. So the way that Salem State structures their School of Education undergrad process is that there is a cohort of classes that happens all in one semester that's methods in all the core um, curriculum areas. And while that happens, the students have a required 12 hours um, weekly experience in a preschool classroom. So these two students both happen to be at the same site, which is a Head Start site in Lynn. Um, one of them is working at a warehouse from 3.30 in the morning until 7.30. She leaves to do her unpaid in internship at Head Start and she returns. Um, she does not have a car. Um, my other student who also was working at the Head Start in Lynn that I'm referencing um, also does not have a car. They're paying Ubers um, to come to campus. And um, we, I mean, it's just small things that I never stop to consider. Like I gave my students a canvas tote bag of math manipulative. So they have like a little bag of counting bears and Unifix cubes and coloring supplies that they're supposed to bring to class so that I can model um, methods, lessons with them. And for one of my students, she has to Uber home from her warehouse job to get the tote bag in order to come to class. So as soon as she told me about the hardship, I was able to have a second tote bag on site for her so she doesn't need to do that. But um, just things that that I wouldn't have anticipated. I'm grateful that somebody, likely somebody in one of your programs, um, taught my students about advocating for themselves. So they're very effective communicators um, with me. Um, but it, you know, I had a text from one of those two students this week telling me that she's already worried about class on Thursday, October 28th, because in Salem, Massachusetts, the week of Halloween, it's a nightmare to get around. And the cost of Ubering from Lynn to Salem on that night will be cost prohibitive. So I was able to reach out to my program director and they're gonna let me teach the class on Zoom so that it's not a hardship for my students. Um, and, and just anyway, what you're doing is really important. I thought I would share about my two students, they're incredible. They're so dedicated and they're so interested and engaged and they really lead so much important conversation that's happening in my class and on the discussion boards the weeks that we're asynchronous. So um, I just wanted to, I guess, add some color to what you are doing. And um, I feel like I'm learning so much from them. I'm trying to give examples of how they are already making me a better early childhood professor, but, um, I just think what you're doing is so important. I feel really lucky that I got to learn about your programs today and um, thank you for what you're doing. Catherine, if I could just respond to that for a second. Oh, something that I often, I often forget to talk about because we take it so for granted at Let's Get Ready because it's so baked into our program model is the job opportunities that we, our mentors are paid $15 an hour. It's a yeah. flexible job, it's remote, you know, it's fun often. And a lot of them, you know, take that experience and go into education or go into public service. And so, you know, it, we wish we could hire more. It's, you know, based on the number of students we're serving, but so many, so many kids are, are in those situations that you just described that, um, you know, a warehouse versus, you know, having, having a couple of phone calls with another college student. And right. Well, and, and the, both of these students are not, um, are not vaccinated because they have concerns about the safety for themselves, which is understandable. So they're moving from high risk situation to high risk situation. And, you know, even just the first night of class, I, because I wasn't at Salem State last year, I didn't take in the fact, just the simple fact that these students were not on campus last year. And so they were sitting in a situation, you know, where they, that they have not been in, in over a year. And, 
you know, it made me think of Maslow's hierarchy of, of education, which teaches that, you know, if we don't, if children don't feel safe and, and have a number of other needs, you know, addressed, they can't learn. And I thought it was, you know, a great example of that. It's, it's hard to picture how they feel in my classroom, they're distanced. We, we, we occupy a large classroom, but it's a lot, you know, for them, there's a lot that's facing them right now and it's daunting. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, that really excellent, compassionate examples. And again, I think it demonstrates the importance of understanding the whole student and the many things that impact them, you know, day to day that may seem obvious uh, or non-consequential, but are really, really important to understand. And I guess reinforces too the ways we can break down those, those barriers to access through partnerships and that may not be obvious at first. So it's important to kind of keep those conversations open. Um, okay, we have time for one more question <clears throat> before we wrap things up. No more questions, comments? Carol, can I just make a quick statement? Uh, as far as opportunities, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that in Lawrence's many other schools, we've seen an increase in parental engagement uh, throughout mm -hmm. the pandemic because uh, virtual um, Zooms and Teams and Google Classrooms have really opened the door for parents who didn't have to worry about daycare, um, meal prep. They were able to participate and engage with their students, educators, um, at their within their home. So I just want to, I think we'd be really missing the boat if we didn't highlight the fact that a lot of parents, and many of you might be parents, uh, were able to participate in ways that we we prohibited them from doing so before. They didn't have to worry about parking or snowstorms or any of those types of things. So we did see a very positive increase in parental engagement uh, throughout that process. I'd be curious if Allison saw something similar in her program or Elaine did, but we sure did. And that's something we want to continue to grow. So thank you. Allison or Lane, do you want to speak to that point? We tr really try and center the students as the person and, and most of our um, students are 18 or older, you know, the 11th and 12th graders are a little on the edge. Um, and so parental involvement is not a, a huge component or something that we measure. Um, but, you know, I, I would guess that what you saw was not unique. Yeah, same here. Okay, great. Um, well, we will be, um, I'm going to wrap things up with just a few things happening at ECCF, but as our promise and commitment to you, we, Megan and I'll be sharing out lessons learned, the recording. Um, we'll also include the decks of all of our speakers and contact information um, and some articles um, or other resources, which we encourage you to, to utilize um, and continue the conversation. Um, and a huge, huge thank you to all of our speakers. I know you all are incredibly busy. I so appreciate the thoughtful conversation and the sharing of data and utilizing sort of all, we're talking about all of the different aspects of this work. And thank you to all of you also for the, um, the great um, questions. It always is amazing to me how we, we always have these really rich conversations that in many ways become sort of platforms for other collective work in the in all of our in all of our spaces so we encourage you to kind of keep the dialogue open just super quick some updates from the foundation um, uh, so we wrapped our food systems resiliency partnership grants early in the summer we are embarking upon mental health um, a, a new grant cycle will be opening soon if you'd like to learn more that's on our landing page I'll be making that live soon and again, just to reemphasize some of the conversations here, it's really about ecosystem um, of all of the parts that touch an aspect of work. Many of the themes would be repeated here um, today. So I encourage you to look online. Um, and we're continually learning about the importance of data and then these kind of coalition models to move things at a population level change. So our next cycle will be um, around mental health and then at some point in the winter, we'll be embarking upon climate and environmental justice. Um, we again have partnered with the state 
on a new round of um, resourcing for the economically disadvantaged and those who have been unable to access federal or state resources during the pandemic. And we'll be doing a brand new report on the COVID reporting, um, the COVID funding that we've done since March of 2020. So that's coming out soon. As uh, Lane talked about, we do have a, an enormous digital, um, digital divide, digital equity initiative. We have lots of study and report that work is rolling out. It's all readily, the information's readily available on our website. <clears throat> We're also leading in partnership with Eastern Bank of Vaccine Equity and Access Six Gateway City um, partnership that is squarely um, placed in listening to the community um, in understanding that they in many ways have the answers to access. And so all we're doing is wrapping around services and embarking upon sort of census style in some, time, in some aspects, census style door knocking to inform and provide access. We talked about mental health. Um, and then from donor services, we have a lot of new initiatives that Megan and I have been working on the, this year. I won't go through them in detail, but there's a lot of new resources coming out. And of course, these awesome lunch and learns, um, but we wouldn't be able to do these without our tremendous speakers uh, like the, the three here today. And again, it's just about authentically listening to the community, um, leveraging data and insight um, to those that are doing the work on the ground. So the next one will be in basic needs in November, women and girls in February, and then youth in June. So with that, I thank you all and um, please stay close. Thanks again. Thanks, Carol. Thank you, Carol. And Megan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Lane.